afternoon, everyone. I'm April, the program manager here at Artadia. Artadia is a national nonprofit arts organization supporting visual artists with unrestricted grants and connections to opportunities for creative and professional growth. Over the past 21 years, we have provided almost 350 Artadia awards to artists in six cities across the United States. Our aim is to provide visual artists with the support they need to sustain a thriving practice and continue to contribute to their city's arts communities. We are also very proud and honored to say we are a founding member of the Artist Relief Coalition. This series of conversations is meant to speak to you directly, applicants, fellow artists, supporters, and friends, in the hopes of shedding some light on how this ongoing crisis is affecting the art world and how we're grappling with it. Before we launch into the conversation today, I just wanna share a little bit more about Artist Relief and who we are. Artist Relief is a coalition of national arts grant makers who have come together to support artists across the United States during the COVID-19 crisis through both financial and informational resources. To date, we have provided $5,000 grants to 2,400 individual artists, so that's 12 million directly to artists in need. If you're an artist and want to apply, you can find our application online at artistrelief.org. It's meant to be very straightforward and only take about 10 minutes. If you've applied in the past and haven't received a grant, you can continue to apply each month, so please do um, apply again. This monthly live conversation series and our weekly series of wellness videos, which you can find here on our YouTube page as well, are presented with the support of Compound, a new contemporary art and wellness complex in Long Beach, California. So thanks so much to Compound. Be sure to follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and here on YouTube for updates about programming, application cycles, and more. A recording of today's conversation will stay available and on the Artist Relief YouTube channel. So thank you all again for joining us for our conversation today, 2020 Awakening, Reimagining Art for the New Normal. This conversation will be live and we'll be taking questions from viewers via the YouTube chat. So please, if you have any questions or comments, you can type them in here. It's such an honor to introduce today's speakers. Uh, joining us today is Eric Gottesman, artist, teacher, co-founder of Four Freedoms and 2009 Artadia awardee. Karen Hartsfield, award-winning screenwriter, director, associate arts professor at NYU and Wide Awakes participant. And Tony Patrick, world builder, immersive director, founder of Tenfold Gaming Initiative and Wide Awakes participant. Artists have such an incredible ability to move us forward and be leaders in social and cultural change. Since its founding in 2016, For Freedoms has served as a platform for creative civic engagement using art as a vehicle to encourage participation, deepen public discussion on civic issues and inspire direct action. In light of the tremendous events 2020 has brought, creators like Aaron, Eric, Karen, and Tony can help us navigate a new normal, begin to view art, politics, commerce, and education from new perspectives and learn how to enact change ourselves. So with that, I'll start us off today with um, just some questions for Eric to provide a little background on Four Freedoms and the Wide Awakes, and then I'll turn it over to Eric, who will lead a discussion with Karen and Tony. Hi, Eric. Hi. <laughs> Thank you again. How's, how's it going? Good, good. Um, good. So let's just start off by learning uh, a little bit more about Four Freedoms, um, what it is, who your, who your co-founder is, and you know what your mission seeks to achieve. Thanks, April. And thank you to Artadia for having us here and Artist Relief, which is doing such incredible work, and, um, and also Creative Capital um, and all the, all the member folks of, of Artist Relief. Um, thank you especially to Artadia because uh, Four Freedoms would not really exist without Artadia. Um, Artadia has been very supportive, um, you know, as a fiscal sponsor and, and also as uh, just a supporter and partner along the way in all this work. So thank you guys for so much for that. Um, Four Freedoms is an artist led initiative to uh, create greater civic and political engagement. And um, we started it uh, not really as a joke, but kind of as a joke between um, my friend and co-founder, one of the co-founders, uh, Hank Willis Thomas and I, when we started as artists um, creating a super PAC in, in 2016, 
around the 2016 election. And we wanted to make the point that artists um, are doing essential civic work. Um, we are always doing politics, uh, even as the structures of art and culture try to draw these distinctions between what is art and what is politics. Um, and we can get into why those lines get drawn. Um, but that, you know, we started then and with our other co-founder, uh, Michelle Wu and many other people um, along the way, we've been running programs for the last four years, um, engaging civic, civic institutions and arts, arts institutions, blurring the lines between what are arts institutions and what are civic institutions, because frankly, I believe arts institutions are civic institutions. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we've been, you know, we've, we've worked with over 300 partners in all 50 states in Puerto Rico and DC. Uh, we've held, um, we've done billboards, town hall meetings, exhibitions, and other artistic interventions. Um, and now we're gearing up for our biggest campaign yet. It's exciting. That's amazing. And I wanted to talk to you too a little bit about, um, you know, I think the, the Four Freedoms Congress was your inaugural Congress in, in LA earlier this year. Um, can you talk about uh, a little bit about what the Congress was and, and the programming that was involved in that? Yeah, for sure. Um, so February 27th through March 1st, we held our first Congress, which let me go back to 2018. We held our previously our largest campaign called the 50 State Initiative, um, where we partnered with organizations and artists all across the country, over a thousand artists. Um, and, and we did activations and billboards and town halls and stuff like that. But the network was very dispersed, intentionally so. It was, it was intended to be a decentralized network of artists and institutions doing what makes sense within their given context. What we realized this year as we kind of geared up for the 2020 campaign in advance of the 2020 election um, was that we wanted to bring everybody together in person, so we did that. Uh, we had 500 delegates, again, representing all 50 states and Puerto Rico. Um, <clears throat> we didn't realize, I mean, we had a lot of partners. We had uh, the Guild of Future Architects um, doing programming. We had the Crenshaw Daily, uh, the Crenshaw Dairy Mart um, doing programming. Our partner institutions out there were uh, the Museum of Contemporary Art, MOCA, LA, uh, the Hammer Museum, um, the Japanese American National Museum. Um, and so we held over three days, we held a number of artistic interventions that uh, really were the best of our network. That's what we built over time is this network of artists and institutions. And this was a, a, a kind of showcase of the best of our network, talking to each other, creating community, and really just figuring out what, how do we do this together. Now that was March 1st, that ended March 1st. Yeah. While we were there, LAX shut down completely because some of the first you know, known cases of, of community spread were happening in LA. And yeah. so uh, then everything, so that became the last real major convening of artists um, this year and for the foreseeable future. I know that's it was an incredible event. It was really amazing. Um, the timing was crazy. Um, the wide awake community was at the Congress as well, right? Yeah, we we sort of envisioned ourselves as entering into the Congress as members of the Four Freedoms Network and kind of exiting as the wide awakes, which we'll get into what the wide awakes are in, in, in a little bit. But it 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 was a way for us to start to pivot, um, you know, I think the way Four Freedoms had always imagined what we are doing is using the kind of disguise and mask of politics and patriotism. Our logo is a flag in red, white, and blue. Um, you know, our, our name Four Freedoms sounds a lot like one of these super PAC kind of names. Mm -hmm. um, so we were we were using a lot of that kind of disguise 
to do creative civic work. And we realized that artists are much more broad than, you know, broad thinking than just thinking within a nationalistic or patriotic or uh, context. So we really wanted to think about how we could expand um, the ways people could imagine art uh, having impact. And so the Wide Awakes, uh, which is based in a historical movement from the 1860s, became a really important tool and framework for, uh, for us. And so we launched it. We made a bunch of capes that people wore. Uh, we had a, a second line ban. We had a lot of different wacky things that happened at the Congress and, uh, and, it, and, and it's been going ever since. Yeah. Well, amazing. Um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to you, Karen and Tony. I'm really excited to hear more about it. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, April. All right, Karen and Tony. Um, Karen Hartsfield and Tony Patrick, two of the uh, the artists founding members of the Wide Awakes. Um, I wonder if first maybe you guys want to just say a little bit about your own individual practice by way of um, introduction, and then we can get into some questions about. Um, about what your experiences have been like over the last several months, and and where we see ourselves going from here. So, Karen, do you want to do you want to kick off? Oh, you're on mute, Karen. I did that very carefully so I wouldn't make a scene. And I didn't. <laughs> um, so, my background is in uh, mostly in narrative work, um, both in um, film and I'm currently working on a, a television show right now. Um, but I've recently very thankfully to the Wide Awakes entering a new part of my practice that I've um, expanded into, you know, non-conventional unorthodox freeform sort of work. And um, my previous work was always sort of dabbling with that or dancing with that. Um, but it was really refreshing to enter a new space and, and stretch creatively in a new way. Um, so it's, it's one of my selling points for the Wide Awake. So um, it inspires you to, to try new things and, and explore your craft in a new way. Mm. And Tony, you, you started in film as well, right? Yeah, started in uh, film and TV uh, as a writer. Uh, spent a little time in Hollywood. I don't talk about that much. Uh, working on TV, uh, uh, selling a screenplay. Found myself uh, returning to New York, working with youth after school, uh, licking my wounds, uh, and then going overseas for a few years to kind of to do what every artist facing a breakdown uh, would decide to do, which is make an album, uh, getting to music. Uh, and then I returned, and uh, since then it's been a journey um, of um, building continuums, world building, uh, comics, uh, and now the Wide Awakes. <laughs> Did I do that in a minute? Did I do that in like fifty seconds? That was that was that was pretty good. I, I, I'm I'm getting better at this. I think I'm, <laughs> I think I'm improving. Yeah, I'm my own LinkedIn. <clears throat> Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, I mean. There's so many uh, twists and turns, but I wonder, I wonder like what, you know, what is, how, let's start with like the recent, because I think the last several months have been um, unimaginable in a certain way. And, um, and I wonder if you guys could describe uh, like some of your experiences during lockdown. I mean, both, both in terms of, your experience of this uh, crazy thing that's happening all around the world and also creatively. Um, you know, how has this affected your creative practice? How, how are you, has it changed your creative practice? Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I've been hearing a lot of people talk about their um, silver linings to the pandemic and, and pretty much everything that's going on. And I'm realizing that 
in my own life, there are so many silver linings that maybe the the metaphor is to be pushed back on that it's more, um, it's an equal part, a disaster and heartbreaking and a crisis or multiple crisis, but also um, a lot of incredible things are happening as well. Um, you know, nationally, collectively, creatively, and personally, um, that I'm finding opportunities for reflection in ways. And, and I think most people are finding the lockdown is forcing us to think about um, our lives and our practices in different ways. And um, it's also forcing us to, or encouraging us, I think, to think about connections in different ways. So I'm connecting with um, friends and a lot of artists in ways that I haven't in years and creating new work because of those new connections. And that's been really um, incredible. But probably most importantly, I'm excited and uh, inspired about what we can do as artists in a new way that I don't think I've ever been before. Watching the, the, the athletes, the basketball players sort of take ownership of their power and claiming their agency, um, I think is something that I see happening in the art community. I think we're still in the beginning stages of it and I feel it percolating. Mm -hmm. And I think um, I'm looking forward to see us you know, fully um, activate each other and and take a, a leap forward and and um, claim our power. Mm. Yeah, yeah. It is interesting to watch like how different parts of culture, you know, are kind of. Um, I don't think of the fine art world as being connected to athletics, but I mean, you know, there there is a lot of. Uh, like I was seen as a jock in art school, which is, a, you know, that, <laughs> that's, that, that should indicate something. But I, I mean, it, it is interesting to see how like cultural boundaries are kind of being crossed at this moment. Yeah. Um, and Tony, you've talked you've talked about like the twin pandemics. Oh boy. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so we are, and, and really, I'm just uh, absorbing that from, I believe there was a uh, preacher in Chicago who said that we're all suffering from the original pandemic, COVID-1619, which is systemic racism. And the moment I heard that, I was like, wow. So we are at a moment of dueling pandemics, COVID-1619 and the novel coronavirus, uh, COVID-19. And I, I think um, I'm going to speak to... Um, Karen, what you just said, and uh, what you also spoke of previously, Eric, was um, I, I feel like there's this, we are, there's a lot of uh, different terms being used for this, this time period, right? So there's the great pause, I've heard. There's, uh, for, for some people, it's, it's the, the great awakening, which we'll get to <laughs> also. Uh, but I'm also looking at the grand opportunity is one that I've heard. Uh, and it does seem like that we have, since March, we've stepped into an accelerated time frame. Um, uh, we have watched the proliferation of digital platforms. We have started working remotely. Uh, I believe that some of us have started to reprioritize. Uh, we're spending more time with family. Uh, there's also a, a, a lot more time to go inward. Um, and so the, the, the lockdown and uh, isolation and um, catalyzation to pay attention to one's well-being, I think is going to give us an opportunity to look at our collective well-being. But if I pull that, if I, if I shift that lens a little bit more, um, it's also a chance for us to, and I, and I believe this is happening, hone in on our own personal expressions. So as artists, uh, I'm watching, and, and I, it's funny because I'm like, I wanted to bring up some questions myself. Like the, the question of uh, what is essential seems to have surfaced during this time period. Uh, concerning this conversation, right? Uh, I think we've all had this conversation. I've had the conversation 
uh, this discussion with the two of you, uh, artists as essential workers has come up as uh, a subject. Um, and I think that we have, as we walk through the portal, um, we're starting to see that art is not just simply an expression. Uh, it is it is a process through uh, for self ref reflection. It is a uh, trajectory towards uh, epiphany uh, and and healing. Uh, and so I think this is the grand opportunity that I I feel like we should be uh, highlighting a little bit more um, as a society. Uh, and I, and I think and I'm just gonna wrap with this part is that I. I think that came to, and I think Karen, you and I might have discussed this, where there was an article in Singapore, um, and I'm bringing up Singapore. Uh, there, there was an article in Singapore where they did a poll originally of who, which jobs are considered essential, and artists were at the bottom of the list. <laughs> <laughs> and so there was a retraction and apology after the outrage, but it really brings up the question, you know, who are we and what are we during this crisis? Mm. And, uh, and, and so that's why I'm also so uh, appreciative and honored to be part of the Wide Awakes, which I believe is also a COVID response as far as I'm concerned. So I, I want to get into the Wide Awakes, but I'm, I love this question of like artists as, as essential workers, because I think it's, I mean, if we think back, 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 you know, artists, art and mythology and, you know, spiritual practice. And I mean, these were all kind of like, and, and healing and healers. I mean, there, there was, there were, there were blurred lines between all these disciplines. Right. Um, so that, that makes a case, I think for like it, Yes, of course, artists are essential works. But I think more recently, even in this country, you know, I'm thinking of like the WPA in, in the 1930s, where artists were seen as essential economic workers and money from the federal government poured into the production um, of art, of art, of literature, of photography, of public sculpture, you know, of architecture. And, and some are kind of resurrecting that idea today you know, as, as a response to what's happening. Like we need another WPA. In fact, I, I think there are even senators that are, that are, that are considering them. Um, but I wonder what, what you think that means exactly. Like what, what is, what is art as an artist, as an essential worker mean? Is it through that economic lens? Is it through, um, is it through the fact that we are, we are ignoring an essential part of ourselves that absolutely yeah i mean i, I mean here's the thing right because uh even and i know we'll get to the wide awakes but even the discussion about i'm going to back up <laughs> and i think it, because i'm like my you know what happens to me my mind goes in 1800 directions at once so uh, to distill it down, I, if we talk about entering the portal, which some people will still try to deny, that the world has shifted, that we are in, we are experiencing a plethora of paradigm shifts. Um, and no matter how much we wanna reopen and go backwards, some things are finished. <laughs> so we, we are looking at, we are standing in and experiencing the byproducts of an extractive uh, system. And we have an opportunity to move into more regenerative spaces, right? So if that's the case, um, and we realize, uh, like I'll, like I, you know, I'll, I'll even bring it back to hip hop, right? In the moment, in some of the darkest moments of, of the pandemic, uh, a classic DJ by the name of D Nice got on Instagram one night and threw a party for hours. And if you could see the feed and the response, um, it, 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 it was transcendental because for a moment, you weren't trapped in your bedroom anymore. You were 
partying on Instagram, hearing shout outs to Michelle Obama uh, and Oprah who stopped by. Who was also on there. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Uh, but but they're, they're, like the shift from celebrity to an interactivity with the public, with, with everyday folks, with society, uh, you know, we are redefining systems and we're redefining um, kind of our antiquated notions of things. Uh, and so if that's the case, here's the opportunity for the artist to be redefined or uh, just reconnected and not stigmatized anymore. And I think that's what we're watching because uh, I think there was this, uh, I don't know, it was like a meme that said, oh, if you think artists aren't important during this time, please uh, turn off your radio or, or get, get turn off Spotify, turn off your television, put down that book and take all the paintings off your wall. But here's the other part of that is that inherently, I do believe that we, we have this thing about the labels of artists, but why don't we look at it as like the creative forces that dwell inside of us. And, and each person during this um, pandemic has been forced to be creative, whether they wanted to or not. A trip to the grocery store requires creativity. Uh, gathering a family Zoom requires some ingenuity. Mm. Like it all, we we're forming new rituals as we speak. So again, I think the, you know, I, I think it's more than an economic lens, which has kind of led us to this extractive model. You know, what is the regenerative model? Not to say that artists don't need funding and support and love, but what is what is the iterative model of artistic expression and practice? I think yeah. part of what we're seeing, we keep using this word awakening. Um, part of what's bubbling up are conversations that we've skipped over in the past and that there are so many conversations that we've skipped over in the past. And so I think to, to, to Tony's point about being essential workers, I think that speaks directly to what artists do, that we um, provoke conversations and we can provoke action. And we do it in a seductive way where some people, you know, may be resistant to um, information in a certain way or resistant to, um, or not thinking about um, certain conversations. Um, but we have um, an opportunity and the ability to call people together to, to be in conversation with each other and, and the other thing that I really appreciate about For Freedoms and the Wide Awakes is the, the reimagining of the, of the public square mm -hmm. and the way that we think about our public spaces and how we can use them. And I think that is, that is an um, important part of why artists are essential workers, because we can talk to people not only, you know, in movie theaters or through television and on radios or what have you, but also we have a way to seduce people into conversations in their everyday lives. Yeah. Yeah. That's such a good point. And, and you've really been kind of watching um, watching what's been happening in terms of how the wide awakes have been manifesting in the in public space. So I want to ask you about that, but I, I, I realize that we haven't really given people a, a context, a background of what the wide awakes are. So uh, I'll try to just do my two minute version um, as opposed to Tony's 10 minute version. <laughs> uh, 25 <laughs> but, minutes. <laughs> but um, basically, in 18, 1860, there was a, a small group of um, abolitionists uh, that were kind of artisans and tailors and, and uh, merchants that wanted to protect abolitionist candidates um, from being beaten, from being, you know, from, from being silenced by, by people that were, uh, that were afraid of these radical views. And so, um, so 
as part of the formation of the newly formed Republican Party, which would bring Abraham Lincoln, you know, into the White House, the Wide Awakes became a, a youth-led movement across the country. Some people say there were um, up to 500,000 members of the Wide Awakes um, all across the country. Um, these were people that were, uh, you know, at their height were pro pro women suffrage, abolitionists, pro immigration, and really pushing for um, for radical systemic political change. But they used a lot of really amazing graphic design, and they used a lot of song and public rallies. Um, so, you know, that's that's kind of the the historical context. We are we have been talking for months and years now about reawakening these wide awakes and using that story as a framework for how we might be able to, as Tony was talking about, you know, reimagine some of these major, major um, systems that are surrounding us. So Karen, do you want to, do you want to say a little bit about like what has been actually happening on the ground among the artists that are at, you know, that are working on this and the kinds of collaborations and, and, and things that have been going on? Sure. So um, the first event of this year um, was uh, an event in Harlem for Juneteenth. And um, it was uh, an incredibly joyful event, which was at this point a very much needed um, release, I would say, for, for everyone. Um, and not only was it uh, musicians and um, dancers and actors and artists of every possible um, imaginable sort, um, but it was an opportunity to um, uh, not only exhale, but also to be in conversation about um, you know, Black Lives Matter, to be a, in conversation about trans lives matter, um, and to have conversations around this joy, right? Um, later we had a uh, July 4th event, and um, this was uh, born out of a really small idea that a friend and I um, were thinking about putting up a little, uh, excerpt of a piece that we have, a uh, video installation. And we said, oh, why don't, why don't we project it in Washington Square Park on, on the 4th? And I said, oh, do you mind if I go share this with the Wide Awakes? This, this kind of thing is right up their alley. So mind you, we were only going to show a five-minute excerpt. That little acorn birthed a six-hour event. And this is what is so incredible about this organization to me, that just c c the conversations uh, birth other conversations and collaborations. And I don't, I don't even know, Tony, how many would you say? Like there were a hundred artists. Yeah. And I might yeah. be underestimating how many people had their, their craft and their art and their energy and their heart in the pot um, to, really share something that was like a beautiful day. That was a beautiful day. And it was another joyful event, but also again, having conversations. The name of the event was Interde Interdependence Day, which felt really appropriate um, in so many ways at, at that point. Um, I don't know, Tony, am I forgetting anything? No, I mean, I think you're, you're speaking to uh, the press play moment. Yeah. of of the wide awakes which is we went from uh you were and eric were, were also part of the studio sessions right uh where we went from conceptualizing what the wide awakes could be as as a potential art project or a collaboration uh in, in hank willis thomas's studio uh to having a few future imagining sessions, collective co-creation sessions. And then all of a sudden, like, like um, Eric spoke to, uh, you know, the wide awakes are announced at Congress, right? Which is a pivotal moment. Um, and then COVID hits. And so uh, I, the opportunity 
realizing that the wide awakes brings us back to uh, becoming a COVID response uh, began to began to kind of emerge, and so I feel like Interdependence Day uh, is, is 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 the kind of quintessential for me. It's become the quintessential wide awakes event on the ground during this time period because it takes. Uh, it was a reaction because the other part of that, Karen, is you brought it to the wide awakes. I remember this to, to the meeting, uh, and we went from wow, this could, this could be really cool to to showcase this at in Washington Square Park, but it doesn't feel like a wide awakes conversation. How would the wide awakes approach this? And independence became kind of an excavation, right? What's underneath, like, and which is what the wide awakes are about as far as I'm concerned, which is this, this continual excavation of what's beneath the layers of our current like stigmas or uh, data points, uh, you know? And so it, independence became interdependence, realizing that we do need one another in, to, in, in order to be a nation and to order to be able to navigate this time. Um, but. Karen, I'm going to challenge you because you know what we haven't done yet is share our screens. So perhaps we should see a little bit more of your work. Oh, I opted not to, to share my screen for technical reasons. Oh, you did not. I did. I, I feel like I should share your screen because <laughs> <laughs> I have those photos. So but I, but I, I guess I wanted you to talk about uh, because there's two things happening, right? This this cultural remix, like the thing, the, the, the amazing thing about the Wide Awakes, and this is not salesmanship, is that it 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 seemed to organically form into not just a collective or not just a movement, but what I am always kind of claiming as a continuum, right? So here we have the framework for more iteration and more collaboration. And that can speak to kind of the most important elements of our lives and information that we need in order to be awake in particular. And so I wanted to just bring up the canopy. The reason why I'm bringing, bringing that up, Karen, is because there is something that you said you're working on uh, in relation to how we can even screen these things because at some point, right, the theaters were shut down. Um, and so you had to figure out a solution, a temporary solution for a mass gathering, how to showcase your work and how to showcase film. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, it's actually a good story about collaboration because it wasn't, uh, I didn't solve the problem. We, there was uh, an architect, Craig Diker, in, um, in one of our meetings and he said, oh, you know what you should do. And he created this really beautiful, um, how do I describe it? A, um, if you picture gigantic weather balloons, um, 10 gigantic weather balloons and a screen floating above and it's um, being anchored by ropes. So the audience would stand under the screen and look up at the film. And purely, uh, it was serendipity that that style of projection was in complete alignment with what my film um, is about and the approach of my film. And um, again, it's it's one of the great things about um, having these conversations outside of your silos because I, I would never think of such a thing. And um, I'm seeing my own work in new ways. But I would I would say more importantly that it's about um, re-energizing the conversation. It's worth noting that, um, you know, George, the George Floyd, the death of George Floyd and um, all of these protests were going on and we're all trying to figure out how can we keep this energy going? How can we keep this conversation going? Um, back to this essential worker idea that this is very much what artists can do, that we can constantly reinvigorate the conversation in a new way. Let's think about it this way and we'll come at it from left, right, up and down. Um, and we can keep protests or um, any kind of conversations from becoming banal. 
Karen, do you mind if I share my screen because I have those two photos? I'm sorry. You're welcome. You're welcome. I, I, I know. I, I, that's just who I am. It's just who I am. You're welcome. Uh, I'm going to see if I can share my screen. Give me a second. Well, and what uh, you're talking about, Karen, I think, yep. while Tony's setting that up, is is um, is indicates in a way as institutions are falling apart and as we all need to find new ways of doing things um, that art can be art creativity the wide awakes as we've kind of collectively disorganizedly uh, conceived of it can be a, a response to to COVID-19 I mean I think this this kind of break, breakdown opens up like you said at the beginning, all kinds of possibilities um, for what, you know, what new things we can make. Yeah. Karen, can you talk, I, so this is, I know the um, the sketch that you were talking about in terms of how to, how to project this film. Could you talk a little bit about the film itself? Sure, um, so it's actually a film um, that I shot many moons ago. Um, this was back when Sean Bell was killed in New York, not long after um, Oscar Grant was killed in California. And um, I knew that this was going to keep happening and it was something that I needed to speak to in my own work. So um, I collaborated with uh, Bradford Young, um, the DP, who's done, this predates the Selma and the arrival and all the big things that he's done now. Um, and he brought on, um, oh, his name just ran out of my head. I'm going to lay down and pass out in a little bit. Um, <laughs> it'll come back to me in a second. But so we shot this film in 2009. And this was the year that I moved to Singapore, which is what Tony was referencing. Um, and because of this big transition and upheaval in my life, I, I put the film on the back burner. There were also technical difficulties. And so I had to put this uh, film on the back burner. And um, so many people said there's beautiful work there. You have to finish it, you have to finish it. And last year in 2019, uh, a dear friend of mine, James Richards said, you know, I really think you should finish this film. And by then I had renamed it, wait for it. And he said, the name alone <laughs> implies that you need to bring this back around. And so, um, and he said, why don't we, you've always been playing with free form. Why don't we just really go full forward with that? And that idea really excited me to sort of set aside the narrative um, for a, a larger experimental piece. And so he recut it and very much became a collaborator, more than just an editor, became a collaborator. And um, yeah, it's a it's an entirely new piece that is has been reborn and is finding new life um, through efforts of uh, for freedoms. It's an excerpt of is, is going to be at Times Square, and it was just shown at the Washington Square Park. So. It's, it's heartbreaking that we're still having these conversations so many years later, um, but it is, I'm, I'm hoping that it is um, a fire under me and other people to really just jump in with both feet and figure out how we can use our craft to, to push conversations further and beyond where they are right now, because I think we have to not only think about this moment um, but also think ahead uh, because it takes time to make work. So, yes. you know, not just, you know, uh, November 3rd keeps coming up, but what about what after November yep. 3rd? Um, mm -hmm. You know, I, I know lots of us have had chills after seeing what's happening in Belarus. You know, maybe I need to be thinking about what might happen here and thinking about what does that art look like right now? Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm again, not only about November and December, but also thinking about a long-term strategy. I, I really appreciate it. I think it was Tony who came up with the, the name of the new normal because how can we think about this 
um, not just as a momentary thing, but as um, a new way of life that we have been activated in a way that's not temporary because I, for one, have a habit of being, you know, very excited during election time in that two, three month span. And then I take my foot off the gas. Mm. And I've seen the ramifications of that kind of behavior. And I, I think we have to be in community about not allowing that to happen again. And that's, that's so much, I think, a part of what's happening I'd say among artists generally right now is that, you know, artists, we're always living in the future, like you're, like you're talking about. And so we're, we're thinking mm -hmm. about a different time frame. And so, you know, like somebody pointed out in the chat that, uh, Tony, you were talking about the importance of not just going back, but also gener generatively moving forward. And Karen, you were saying we were going, we were going back to conversations that have needed to take place. I think that like, as we're reimagining, you know, revisiting, reimagining, yeah, yeah, reimagining even like July 4th, Independence Day, into Interdependence mm -hmm. Day. It's it's a process of decolonization that um, is opened up by the possibility by the possibility of of time travel or of of moving back and forth. And Tony, I know you think a lot about this in your work broadly, mm -hmm. um, and and especially around inside of it. I don't know if you could you talk a little bit about yeah I, I think because you just landed on I'll do two things you just landed on uh, something that of course we focused on uh, in the futurist writers room I'm also part of the Guild of Future Architects which is uh, which is creating a continuum of amazing forward thinkers and, and practitioners who are creating projects that, that start in the commons for the greater good instead of for profit as is, in, let's say, a startup, right? But there's an initiative called the Futurist Writers Room inside of that group. Uh, and one thing uh, that we focus on uh, as part of one of our exercises is finding the inflection point, right? So where, where is the point in history where we could have made a different choice? Uh, and where could we have created a new artifact that brought us to and brings us to an alternative present that we want to live in and ultimately a future that we'd like to thrive in. Um, and so I think we are in an actual inflection point. That's what 2020 is. Um, but I would like to share my screen very quickly. Um, we'll work this out and uh, just uh, deal with my work for just a second. Uh, and I can do this quickly. Um, you know, part of my work from TV and film had, had, had led me into comics. I've done work for D DC Comics. Uh, for some people, the most important thing I've ever done is write Batman dialogue. Uh, I would beg to differ, um, although it is important. Um, but that led me into a Verizon 5G residency where I have, talking about, uh, speaking of reimagining, where I've been reimagining comics. So experiential comics, which could incorporate uh, augmented reality, virtual reality, in, in this case, uh, uh, volumetric uh, capture and motion capture uh, for a new form of comic book is, is something that I've embarked on. Um, but that also leads me to my world building process, which I was part of a, a 2017 world building residency. And the reason why that's important is that it, it is the first time that I felt the convergence of all of my skills. and. Uh, uh, where I realized that you could create fictional worlds, but you can create fictional worlds and speculative futures in particular, or reimagine geographical uh, geographical locations or cities uh, in the future and distill that down into actionable items for real world modern day impact. Um, I think there's a creative capital um, grant recipient, uh, Lawrence, uh, 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 Lauren McCarthy, who was also part of my initial uh, world building cohort with Sundance. So big up Lauren. Uh, but this photo is from the studio when we started talking about the wide awakes and figuring out if there could be uh, honing in on the values that we'd like to see, honing in on an aspirational society and future we'd like to live in if the wide awakes still existed. Um, and that brought us to the very real moment of the Wide Awakes, and this is a, a shot of our, our website at wideawakes.com, where 
you know, a group of us uh, who decided to, to, to keep it going, to, to, to go from the moment of the launch at the Congress to finally pressing play in real life uh, post, uh, you know, George, George Floyd's death. Um, uh, and then, uh, you know, initiating these on the ground events. Um, but that also brings me to, we do have a sci-fi expression called uh, side eye, which is taking the premise and playing with that hypothetical of an inflection point where the wide awakes decide not to disband uh, after Abraham Lincoln is, is elected, but and to instead go underground as a knowledge gathering organization. Um, uh, the the side eye is a is a organization that allows us to kind of take a different lens uh, and uh, put our capes on, which is another one of our wide awake slogans. Um, it is all about finding out who those twenty twenty wide awakes are, um, and then all of that is brought me to. And this is my last slide. No worries. Uh, Recipes for sanity, which is a hub now. Uh, another one of my COVID responses, along with a lot of other collectives from Guild of Future Architects, we have Wide Awakes, people who are uh, giving their personal strategies to navigating, you know, the next normal. Um, and so that being said, um, where I think, again, being in that inflection point, we've we've reached this time, I feel like in particular, where uh, Eric, you were talking about, it's, it's, here's the name of the panel, reimagining art, but we're also reimagining institutions and reimagining, uh, reimagining systems. So what is the role of an artist? What is the role of, of an institution? What is the role of uh, essential outputs that can shift culture? that can shift human consciousness. And I think that is what the work of the wide awakes is. Mm. Mm. I'm gonna breathe. Yeah, and, and uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's very elegantly said. I mean, I, I think, um, you know, you could insert a quote from Toni Morrison or, or Nina Simone or about the artist role, you know, inside about James, you know, from James Baldwin, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but I think, I think ultimately it's to listen to oneself. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, my that's my opinion. <laughs> but, but I think I think that I think that's something that um, it, you know it's something that I wanted to point out about the wide awake. We're talking about it as though it's a, a group or an organization. It's it's really intended, like the original movement was intended, mm -hmm. to be a kind of decentralized. Leader, leaderful kind of movement of mm -hmm. of creative people and of artists. So, um, if you're wide awake, then you know you're wide awake. So, uh, like you know, to anybody watching, to anybody that wants to participate, you know, it, there's there's a very um, it's it's both a low low bar for entry and a high bar for entry. I mean, it it is a commitment on your own behalf to to participate, um, and you know, I think there's a lot of really amazing examples of leaderful movements. I mean, we can look at what happened over the weekend with the National Black Convention and the Movement for Black Lives. That is, you know, 100, 150 leaders, 150 organizations that are leaders coming together to build a, a, a political movement, you know, where creativity is a, is a major part of it. Um, Tony, you well, look like you had something to say. I, I was just going to say, I mean, if, if we're talking about being a leaderful decentralized uh, collective or continuum. I mean, I, I definitely have to mention that we've gone from, let's say, three to four on the ground events, which have ranged from Interdependence Day and Juneteenth um, into celebrating women's uh, suffrage um, uh, at, at Prospect Park. I mean, Ebony, Ebony Brown, Jose Parla, uh, Black Thought, um, uh, the Blacksmiths uh, is another collaborative organization. Um, and we've also started chapters. There's Wide Awakes Berlin, right? That joined us for Inter Interdependence Day. There's, uh, I, I believe, a Wide Awakes Japan starting. Uh, and, uh, and I can't forget Wide Awakes Chicago, um, which uh, Mecca Brooks and Mario Smith uh, and, and countless others 
uh, I think, joined forces this past weekend around the March on Washington uh, to commemorate that with writing on the wall with Dr. Baz, right? Uh, which uh, started to highlight uh, writings from uh, the incarcerated population. Uh, but Wide Awake Chicago is, is, is a prime example of what happens when a community uh, decides it's awake and wants yeah. to express itself. So I yeah. just, you know, I had to throw in yeah. other members and, of the family here. Um, and Havana and, um, you know, there, there's Minneapolis. Right. I mean, there's, there's different kind of groups ha you know, <laughs> coming up. And now what we on the For Freedoms side are doing and also among the crew, crew of Wide Awakes folks, we're creating toolkits and playbooks yep for how people can play with us. You know, we're really seeing this as part of an infinite game, not a finite game where there are winners and losers, but an infinite game where we all get to continue to play together. Um, on, I think it's next Tuesday. Yeah, next Tuesday, Fort Freedom is gonna be rolling out our infinite playbook for ways people can get involved in, in the 2020 awakening, which is what we are um, building this year as a campaign on top of our 50 state network. Um, I know the Wide Awakes. We're producing a, a toolkit um, that will be that will be released soon. There's going to be a lot of exciting um, things that are that are happening in the next uh, next few, little bit. There's also I wanted to mention next uh, Wednesday we're going to be uh, on the ninth. We're launching a Kickstarter among all the different organizations. We're really trying to. Um, move from a, a vision of arts, philanthropy and arts funding uh, as scarcity to a vision of it as abund abundance. So we're really trying to imagine all of us walking together, which we all are already in our own work, in our own paths, uh, our own creative work. So all of, uh, there's like 12 or 13 different creative organizations that are launching a Kickstarter together to, to really raise awareness and funding for creative civic engagement in the next two months. Um, somebody asked for the Wide Awakes website link. I think there's there's a wide, wideawakes.com. Yes. There's also, uh, there's forfreedoms.org. There's Wide Awakes 2020 on Instagram. Uh, and there's a bunch of now different Wide Awakes clubs <laughs> happening all over on Instagram. I know we are up against time, um, but nobody's kicking us off yet. So Karen, Oh, yes. Somebody might be kicking us off. Um, Karen, I didn't know if there was anything else that you wanted to add. Um, no, I mean, I, I'll just say, going back to your first question about the, the arc of this summer, I, I know a lot of people, including myself, had a, a mini existential crisis in the midst of this lockdown. Um, and if you are feeling that now or feel that at any point, I would um, advocate for being active and al aligning yourself with the purpose of what uh, an artist can do. That there is nothing more healing than that for us than to, to claim our power and to be active and to activate your collective, activate the people around you and um, make moves. Yeah, that's great. I, I would say, uh... Uh, just very quickly, a friend of mine, uh, uh, his mother said she had a dream that she was collaborating with an artist and she uh, woke up in a sweat because she realized she didn't want to work with, with her friend who was an artist. She said, I am embracing my inner accountant. I love the numbers, is what she said. I'm embracing my inner accountant. I'm going to uh, challenge people to do the opposite. I'm going to say, embrace your inner artist. Embrace your inner creative during this time period. Um, and I, again, I think there's a lot of wonderful ways you can align yourself. And, and I think the Wide Awakes and Four Freedoms are all about collaboration. And I think there's, this is a great way, especially with the 2020 Awakening, which is centralized around the next two months uh, for that, you know, that special event in November. Um, so we can centralize that around that, collaborate and find ways to, to navigate and help one another. And so, beautiful, beautiful. Well, I think April is gonna come back on, but I just wanted to say thank you again uh, for having us all on. 
and for for uh, for letting us talk a little bit about all this stuff. It's been amazing. It's been such a pleasure and honor to all of you. So Karen, Tony, Eric, thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Um, I just also want to take a second to thank our interpreters, um, Trisha and Kelly, and also Krista and Isaac at Creative Capital for all their work uh, making this event happen. Um, it's been a pleasure for everybody. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. So. Thank you. Thanks for having us.